Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Again, we ask you to bless our day. We ask you to forgive our sins. We ask you to heal our land and our families. Lord, teach us how to love you. Teach us how to love each other. Teach us how to forgive. Father, teach us, humble us so we may learn not only who you are, but who we are in you. And to walk a holy life contrary from evil. We love you. We adore you. Father, we are listening to you. I thank you for the listeners, your people, and I pray that they hear you, not me. Speak through these lips and guide me and your people through what you have for us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Real quick, it's been a long time. Um, I'm so excited for today's sermon. I actually have rehearsed this. I've been studying for this sermon. Normally, I don't do this. I've probably said it a few times before, but this is the first sermon that I've actually taken the time to intensely write. So I hope you guys like it, and it's going to be something I'm going to be doing on a regular basis. It's because I can't get tied up in my opinion, and I can't get tied up in my emotions, and I want you guys to hear what God has for you straight. So this is what I'm going to be doing, I'm sure, for the rest of my life, and I hope you guys get something out of it. All right, today's topic is... What is truth? What is truth? T R U T H, truth. The definition of truth is something or someone that is in alignment with fact or reality. Truth, in the most absolute sense, does not change over any given time and is considered to be the ultimate ground of reality. The Hebrew word for truth is omen, which could mean faithful, reliable, assured, established, establishment, stability, to be right, to be sure, or to be true. Omen also comes from its root word, amen, which means truly or so be it. The Greek meaning of amen is to be firm. The Greek word for truth is aletheia, which means unclosedness or unconcealedness, openly shown or the action of making secret information known. The state of not being hidden or hiding, or lastly, the state of being evident, factual, or real, grounded in the physical reality. Epistemology aims to answer questions such as, what do we know? What does it mean to say that we know something? What makes a belief true? And how do we know that we know something to be absolutely true? Epistemology is the investigation of what distinguishes justified belief from mere opinion in the natural world. Through logic based off of evidence in nature, in order to prove that something is true, we generally need to ask four key questions questions that helps us to identify truths from opinion the first question we ask is the nature of knowledge in order for something to be true the knowledge needs to match the evidence within the physical reality or world and only then will it be justified as true second the potential sources all sources that are supporting the evidence need to be liable, including all witnesses who were present 
and their testimonial statements. The third is having a good form of knowledge, which gathers all the sources or beliefs about the topic and finds no contradictions between any of the sources. And lastly, philosophical skepticism asks what are the historical problems or what were the historical problems and beliefs at the time the event occurred and were there skeptical critics at the time because usually when something happens there's usually skeptical criticism you don't believe me look on Facebook all right so I'm gonna give you an example of what how or how to identify something that is true from something that is false all right, I'm going to run through the four steps as we just read. What is this? Hopefully you can identify this. This is a pen. Well, that is my truth statement. I'm claiming this to be a pen. But is it a pen? What is the mechanics of a pen? Or in other words, what is the definition of a pen? Let's look at what the definition of a pen is. An instrument for writing or drawing with ink, typically consisting of a metal nib or ball or nylon tip fitted into a metal or plastic holder. Let's run through that again, one by one. Is that true? Where is my supporting evidence of this to be true? That's the statement. Now I need to prove that the statement is true. Can a pen write or draw? Let's look. I have my pad. Can it write? Yeah, it can write. Can it draw? Sure, there's a smiley for you. So, can the pen writer draw? Yes, that is true. That is my physical evidence based off of reality. Does it have a metal nib, ball, or nylon tip? I'm pretty sure you guys have seen a pen before. Yes, it has a metal nib ball or nylon tip so that is true about it is it fitted together into a metal or plastic holder this is plastic but there are metal ones yes it is and lastly are there witnesses who have witnessed this themselves and do their statements match yours or mine does your statement match mine probably not exactly but for the most part yes so is this a pen According to the statement that was provided and the physical evidence that we've seen, yes, this is a pen. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Again, in order for something to be true, it needs to be grounded in the physical reality. Not just hearsay. Okay. If there is truth that is not just opinion based, but truth that is factual in reality, then who established it first? Who ordained it? Who appointed it to be what it is? You see, this is appointed and ordained by man. And we create things all the time. But what about the real things that, that never change? Let's go further. Nowadays, everyone seems to have their own interpretation of truth, whether it's political, religious, or mere opinion against opinion. It all seems to be relative in everyone's eyes these days. They say things like, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. Let's just agree to disagree. In some cases, we can do that. That's called having a personal preference. But think about that personal preference. But that cannot be done with absolute truths at all. You know why? Because absolute truths aren't relative. And I'm going to dive into that a bit. It's a poor excuse for dealing with the problem at hand. Is to say that we all have our own opinion about absolute truth. Absolute truth is absolute truth. No matter what. What is truly right is right. And what is truly wrong is wrong and grounded in reality, not yours or my opinion. Let's see what the Bible has to say about truth. John 18, 37 through 38. 
You are a king, then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is the truth? replies Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Was that his opinion or was that actually true? Here we have Jesus saying, there's a fact, there's a reason, and there is a truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me, Jesus is saying. So let's ask some truth questions about this. Or general truth questions. Is it okay to desire what someone else has and do whatever it takes to obtain it? Some would say yes, some would say maybe, others would say no. Is it okay to lie? Some would say it depends. Most people would say no. Is it okay to steal? Most people more than likely would say no. Is it okay to cheat on your spouse? I hope everyone says no to this. Is it okay to kill people? God forbid. Hell no. There's just five of the Ten Commandments. And God gives us more. Okay. It just still doesn't prove that the Bible is true. You're right. Let's dive in a little further, okay? And look at the text in the Bible themselves. And see if their statements line up with physical reality. The book of Genesis. The definition of Genesis is the origin or mode or formation of something. In other words, someone is forming something and designing it for a particular purpose. It's, it's where it came from. Where did it come from? Where did design come from? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this statement in the Bible is not poetry or imaginary. It's a literal statement or a statement to be taken literal. Is there any evidence of a heaven or like universe outside our atmosphere in the physical world? Do you see any? Yeah, I see a sky and at nighttime I see stars and stuff. So, yes, that's true. Is there any evidence of a Earth's existence? Yeah, we're standing on it. Am I telling the truth about this statement in the Bible? Is God created the heavens and the Earth. Well, I'm not so sure about the God part, but I see a heaven and I see an Earth. So, yes, in that case, this statement is true. Genesis 1, 5, and God called the light day, and darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So let me summarize this up. It's the morning right now, so I call it day. Most people do, and when the sun sets, most people call it evening or night. So is that statement true? I would presume, personally, yeah, it lines up with reality. And this was recorded in the Bible 3,000 years ago. All right, let's go a little further, a little deeper. Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Another statement to be taken literal. Are human beings creative like God? When we look around the world, I see a lot of creative people. Not just their created being, but their ability to create like God. Yes, I think that statement is true. Do all human beings have eyes, ears, and can all human beings speak? How we were designed, for the most part, without def defects? Yeah, all human beings were designed to hear, to speak and have eyes. So with that being said, are all human beings human beings? 
What does that mean? Are all human beings human beings? Yeah, I don't see a half human being, horse, or ox, or bird. I've never seen it, have you? Or mutation in involvement from one species to the next. For the most part, 3,000 years ago this book was recorded. And human beings are still human beings. Do human beings rule over animals? You ever been to a zoo? Exactly. For the most part, we can kill pretty much anything. Do fish exist? Yes. Do fowl who fly in the air exist? Fowl, what does that mean? Like birds? Yes, that's what it means. Do cattle exist? Yes. So do creeping things like bugs exist? Yes. So each one of those things were in that first statement in Genesis 126. Are all those true? Are all those appearing in our physical reality? Yes. So it means it's true. I think, I believe, I mean, that's, uh, you know, you got milk, you got chocolate, you put them together, you get chocolate milk, you know. <laughs> so with that being said, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, male and female. Now this was recorded in the Bible, yet again, 3,000 years ago, and it's meant to be taken literal. I've never seen someone born gay. I've never seen someone born lesbian. I've never seen someone born a transsexual. I've seen men being born, boys being born as males, and girls being born as females. Still 3,000 years ago, still today. So with that being said, the Bible says it's unchanging. The Word of God never changes. The truth never changes. Let me get to the point about all this. If God exists, then I would suppose that He would have left clear evidence pointing to His existence. If the Bible is God's Word, then everything in here, let me show you, because I have a Bible up here, should be the truth and have supporting evidence for each and every fact or literal statement in here. So let me summarize that for you. If the Bible is true, then everything in here that is to be taken literal and not the poetry parts is true. And it should have supporting evidence in our reality, in our world, through archaeology, through history, through everything. If we look at every person who ever lived in here, or every event that ever happened in here, for the most part, we should find all of these out here. All right, let's ask some questions about things that happened in the Bible. Such as, did the creation week in Genesis, all the statements that creation said that literally happened, do they line up with our physical reality? And where is the evidence? Did Moses exist? I'm sorry. Did Moses exist? And did he flee from Egypt with Israel from slavery? Where is the physical evidence? Was there a city named Jericho that fell? Where is the physical evidence? Was there a king named David or a King Solomon? Where is the physical evidence? Was there a king named Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over Babylon in 605 BC? Where is the physical evidence? Was there a governor in Rome named Pontius Pilate? Where is the physical evidence? Did a man named Jesus really exist who was crucified on a cross? And most importantly, did he actually rise from the dead? Where is the physical evidence? Out of all the questions we can ask about the Bible, I suppose the most important question to ask is, if Jesus really existed and was crucified on a cross by a man named Pontius Pilate, who was a governor at the time of Rome, the most important question that we can ask is, Without a doubt, if Jesus Christ existed, died on a cross, and rose from the dead, is absolutely true, 
then I suppose the real question is, why would someone willingly reject the truth? So, we gave a general statement about what truth is. Let's find out what the Bible says, or let's find out what Jesus Christ says about the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here Jesus states that he is the way to the truth and that he has the truth with him and that he knows the truth about life. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am all truth. That's a big statement. It's a big claim. I mean, saying I am all truth is like saying I know everything. Or saying I am God because God knows everything. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoa. Okay. Prove it. Let's say I believe you for a second. Let's look at John 8. 32. Jesus says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set me free. Okay. What do you mean? Why do I need the truth? Why would I want the truth? In John 8, 32, Jesus says it will set you free. Set me free from what? I don't know. We'll find out. What does it mean to be free? Apparently, Jesus is referring to being free from death, free from pain, free from human suffering, free from sin, free from burdens. Wow. Do you know that you have them? Do you have sin in your life? Do you have burdens? Do you have suffering? Do you have anger? in your life? Are you suffering from those things? Do you not want to be free from those things? If Jesus has the truth, then who is Jesus? John 1, 1 through 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. By the way, I love that one. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh. And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son. Who came from the father. Full of grace. And truth. In John's gospel. John gives us a clear testimony. Of who Jesus is. Not only. Was he in the beginning of creation. With God. But who is God. And that his very identity is the words of God, which is the words of truth. Okay, I got it. How do I find Jesus so I can apply his truth to my life? Okay? John 6, 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. The words that I have spoken to you are full of spirit and life. Jesus claims that his words, teachings, and his life is filled with the truth about God. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What does the truth give you? It gives you rest for your souls. Rest from your burdens, rest from your pains, rest from your sorrows and anxieties. And ultimately, it gives you rest from fearing death. John 6, 56, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. How do I drink someone's flesh or drink someone's blood and eat their flesh? Well, let's find out. Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. 
Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, as we said. It's this, the testimony, the witness of Jesus. Okay? The testimony of Jesus, the Son of God, is the words of truth. And whoever has the testimony of Jesus has the yoke that Jesus is talking about. They have the truth. They have the words that Jesus is talking about. Where is the testimony of Jesus found? Luke 24, 44, Jesus says, He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The truth about Jesus and God are not only found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the entire New Testament and Old Testament. The testimony of Jesus, who is the truth, who is the Word of God, is found in the Word of God, in the Holy Bible. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Wow, where's Jesus and where's the truth? In the Holy Bible. There's only one, folks. So, can the Bible be trusted? Again, the definition of truth in the most absolute sense does not change over any given time and is considered to be the ultimate ground of reality. <sighs> you want to meet someone who's crazy? <sighs> I don't. Not a good crazy, a bad crazy. No, I don't. They'll be talking about fairy tales and myths. I don't know about you, but I've I've never met a leprechaun or seen one. <laughs> Let's move forward. Matthew 24, 35. Jesus says, the Bible says, actually, that the truth never changes. He says that his words will never change. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. God is telling the truth about everyone without the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of truth, is a liar. Let me say that again. Anyone without the spirit of Christ, without the spirit of truth, is a liar. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. He has he said and Will he not do, or has he spoken, and will he not do good on what he said? Human beings tend to lie all the time, whether accidental or intentional. But God says, I am incapable of lying. If you don't believe me, test me. Test my word, the Bible. And see if you actually find, or can find, any fault in it. A lot of people think they can, and a lot of people are still trying to disprove the Bible. That's another sermon or topic to talk about. I'm not going to get into that. Jesus was, is, and will ever be the only one who was without fault. In other words, he was the only perfect person. So let's take a look at Jesus' example or his life and what he defines as truth and how he lived. John 10 24 through 32, Jesus says, If you asked me a favor, and I said I would do it, and do not do it, that would make me a liar. But if you asked me for a favor, and I did what you asked me for, you would have great evidence to believe me. In other words, Jesus has always backed up what he said with what he did. And he is saying that his actions prove that he is not a liar. 
Raise your hand if you've met someone who said something and did not do what they said they would do. Raise your hand if you've been that person. Yeah. Or let's reverse it because I know you're probably not raising your hand. Don't raise your hand <laughs> if you have not done something that someone asked you to do. <laughs> don't, raise, don't raise your hand if you've met someone. <laughs> let's get to it. For example, if I asked you... If you asked me to go to the store and pick you up a Coke, and I said I would do it, but I came back with nothing or a Sprite or something you didn't ask for, you would more than likely be upset and gradually begin not to trust in what I say anymore. However, if you asked me to go to the store and pick you up some vanilla ice cream, and I came back with vanilla ice cream, you would not only be happy, but you would begin to build your trust upon me a little, a little more. And the same thing applies to our lives, especially when it comes to marriage. It reflects our faith as well. When we make a vow to be there for someone physically, emotionally, or intellectually, through rich or poor, happiness or suffering, suffering, shouldn't we be living up to what we say? If not, we will be found to be a liar. It is the same thing when it comes to God. He makes that same oath to us when we decide to be a Christian. We are making a vow, a promise, like a marriage, to be faithful to him no matter what the opposition, circumstances, trials, or suffering. We will remain faithful to our promise, even though we make mistakes, he picks us back up again. God, on the other hand, never falls short of his promises to his people who have decided to devote their entire lives to him and fulfilling his will for their lives. Joshua 1, 16 through 18. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And whatever you send us, we will go. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. We make the same promises to God when we claim to be Christians. We will obey you, Lord. You will be our God and we will be your people. We will do whatever you say. We will go wherever you command. And anyone who doesn't obey your word or your teachings is in obvious rebellion towards you. I'm going to pause a moment. We're not going to be perfect in this world while we're in these sinful bodies. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be striving for perfection. We're not competing against one another. We're competing against Christ. Striving to enter through that narrow door to be like Christ. So we have no means or to compare each other with each other because we're all sinful. We all fall short. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to be perfect. Jesus says, Be holy, for I am holy. And this is the list of commandments that He has given us. God is actually fulfilling the Old Testament. Jesus says, not a word of the law will vanish unless every iota, every little cursive slang at the end of a letter is completed. Now we have the Holy Spirit. Now we have no excuse. Strive to enter through the narrow door. You fall. Grace is provided so, to, so we can get back up and try again. And eventually master our sin and rule over it and not 
allow it to rule over us. Jesus said when he had forgiven Mary Magdalene, go and sin no more. Grace is not provided for us to take it for granted. Grace is provided so we can try again and strive for perfection. There's a lot of Christians in this world that I've met that think that they can continue not to discipline their lives and not to live holy and they can do whatever they want. That's not the truth. I say all that to say this. If you want to know whether something or someone is being truthful, weigh their actions by reality. And is there physical evidence to back up what they say or to back up the statement of what they're saying is true? If there isn't, then it's a lie and they are lying. Unfortunately, the people of the world always tend to believe whatever everyone says instead of testing the facts and seeing if there are actual evidence to back it up. People believe in anything these days. We need something to believe in. But I'm not going to believe in a lie, and I hope you won't either. There's also a belief going around in the world that's pretty much popular. It's okay for you to believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. But you don't have the right to tell me I'm wrong. That's just your opinion. And in some cases, that can be true. But not about truth statements. For example, if I steal something from you, I bet you'll be very angry with me. Not only will you be angry with me, you would claim, you would say, hey, what you did was wrong. But if I used that worldly mentality, that's just your opinion. You believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe. You'd be very upset. We can't all believe that everything is relative because we're going to step on each other's feet sometimes and bump into each other. What are we to do then? And all this division in the world, they don't know what truth is anymore. They've lost the center line and it looks like whatever. It's not straight anymore. Don't be that person. Where do you get your examples from when it comes to what a marriage is supposed to look like. Where do you get your examples from when it comes through how, how to work? Where's your examples from how to be friends with each other? Where's your examples from? Where do you get your standard? I hope it's not from each other. I hope it's from some sort of law or rule that we can all strive towards. Sadly, most people have wandered away from the actual truth and basically find teachers who basically won't tell them they're wrong and are they need to repent and say I'm sorry to that person or change their actions. In other words, people don't want to accept the truth. And so they'll go find other teachers who will please them in their sin and say, oh, it's okay to be gay or lesbian or transgender. It's okay you know, but it's not okay. The truth is written on each and one of our hearts. And we're not obeying the truth. That's when we feel shame and guilt and anger. God has given us an example of how he expects us to live. With that being said, what will happen to a world that loses truth when they start rejecting the truth for a lie. What happens to a world that no longer recognizes truth but believes that all is relative and everyone is right about whatever they want to believe to be true? What happens to a world that rejects Jesus Christ as their Savior who is the embodiment of ultimate truth? What happens to a world that redefines truth for themselves or how they feel or their opinion rather than factual evidence which is grounded in physical reality what happens to a world who rejects 
ethical truths such as our conscience for a counterfeit of sinful desires that lead to misbehaving in society. What happens to a world who reject the truth written within the laws of government for no laws at all because they are law to themselves? Overall, in order to understand truth, we first need to understand Jesus and how he, who is the Bible, interprets words. Because Jesus, being the word of truth, the word of God, carries all the proper meanings and interpretations of the true essence of words with him, as God once did with Adam. Genesis 2.20 So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Genesis 3.20 Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Before the fall, Adam was able to properly distinguish objects and reality as truth from that of his own opinion or imagination, to the point where he even named his own wife Eve. When God establishes something by name, it forever remains its unchanging name and knowledge or which he names it is the center of God's identity and he who is the truth never changes. Let me say that again. When God establishes something by name, it forever remains its name and unchanging. And he created knowledge and the names of them. And it is the center of God's identity. And he who is the truth never changes. John 1, 1 through 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He establishes words. He establishes names. And they never change. And he is the Word of God. Matthew 24, 30. Five, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The truth is to have the proper interpretation of knowledge of God. The truth is to have the proper interpretations of the knowledge of God. However, if we don't understand words and how they function, we could fall into the abyss that Satan deceived Adam and Eve with, falsely informing them. They couldn't interpret words. How could they interpret sentences or paragraphs or speech? Properly interpreting the meaning of each and individual word is to properly interpret God, is to properly interpret sentences, is to properly interpret paragraphs and books and literature. Genesis 2, 16 through 17, And God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Unfortunately, this has already happened, and that is why humans still die today. However, the most people these days still get tangled up in knowledge, tangled up in truth, in misinterpreting literature, misinterpreting God's word, misinterpreting each other, and redefined the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of literature, the knowledge of words for themselves, for a lie. And then they ultimately redefine right and wrong for themselves. Let's rewind time for a second before the fall of Adam and Eve. We see Satan here attempting to twist the meanings of what God has eternally established in exchange for his own interpretation of truth through a lie by switching syntax changes the meaning entirely in order to get them to disobey God. Oh, God told me to do this. Did he really tell you to do this? Or are you allowing the serpent, which is in your physical flesh, nature, to interpret what you heard or hear from God or his word. Genesis 3.3 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, 
Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, obviously that was a lie. Come to find out today, still a lie. When we look at the world around us today, everyone has their own interpretation of truth. Everyone has their own interpretation of knowledge. Everyone has been deceived by Satan because of what they don't understand. In order for the biblical definition of truth to be valid, every original translation of the Bible must be first called into question and without a doubt prove that there is a clear continuity exchange between the ancient manuscripts recorded in the Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and Aramaic scrolls that still resemble the same interpretations and meanings as we use today in our modern English Bibles, showing no contradictions between any of the text, and only then will it prove to be valid. In our word-for-word -word trans, uh, in our word-for-word -word study of the word, word truth, in these languages, we found there to be a very identical substance and meaning from one language to another. With that being said, this should give us great confidence that the words we are using today still hold the same value and meaning of those old languages used at their dated time, and thus holds an unchangeable standard of how we ought to preserve and safely handle words in their original context. If we don't protect our words, and their original meanings. Our interpretation of words will change. And if our interpretation of words change, then our, how we understand things will be different. And if our understanding is different, then our perception will be divided from one another. And if we are divided by misinterpreting words, how much more will it affect our speech, writings, friendships, marriage, business, morality, laws, or worse, how we understand God's word? Everything cannot be relative because more than likely it will eventually contradict someone else's opinion and people's lives. If we cannot come to the same understanding of individual words and their proper meanings, then we will never be able to come to an understanding on anything we do in life, which will allow for a chaotic world of disorder and the fall of morality because of the loss of proper interpretation of words, that will eventually move into our textbooks. They already have. The universalists believe that they can redefine anything they like, whenever they like, however they choose, including redefining their gender, their sexual orientation, morality, the Bible, and ultimately the truth itself will not be recognized even if the truth was staring right at you or them dead in the face, as Jesus did Pontius Pilate. And our application, lastly, is how we apply or obtain the truth into our lives. John 16, 13, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. We cannot know the truth without the spirit of truth, and he will be the one who guides us into all truth, not ourselves. He will only say what he hears from God, and then he will tell us. In other words, he will tell us the truth about our lives and how we're living, and he'll say, Jeremy, that is wrong. Jeremy, don't do that. Jeremy, this would be nice if you did that. He will discern, he will give us wisdom and discern right from wrong. How do we get the spirit of truth? Acts 2.38 Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
when we acknowledge the God of the Bible is the only true God and that we need a Savior, then the first thing that we should do, it says, is repent. Saying, I'm sorry, and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The next step is to get baptized in His name, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And only then can we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is the truth. I'm going to wrap it up right now. If you are unsure whether or not, if you are in the truth, then you're probably not. But still living in the world of sin and rebellion to God. Because the truth is for those who are willing to repent of their sins every day. Repent of your sins every day and fully surrender to every desire in your heart. Surrender all your desires in your heart and live in pursuit to the plan that God has for your life. Pursue what God has for your lives. This is what it means to put your whole trust in Jesus. This is what it means to put your whole trust in Jesus. I'm saying it over and over and over again. Say people say, I trust Jesus, but they are not pursuing the plans that God has for their lives. Each person must come to that conclusion for themselves. No one else can make that decision for you each and every day for the rest of your life. You have to make that choice every day to pursue God's will for your life each and every day. No one else can make that choice for you. You have to make that choice for yourself. And each person has to make that choice for themselves. And only then, Jesus says, will you find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for your blessings and your guidance and your discipline. I pray for these people, and I pray for myself, that we would desire your will above our own each and every day. We would repent of our sins each and every day so we, too, may find rest for our souls until Christ come. In Jesus' name, amen.